The Stanford's Travel Writers Festival 2021 is braced to bring back festival favourite Leveson Wood. And here he is in conversation with Ash Bardwaj. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining and welcome to this session of the Stanford's Travel Writing Festival. I'm Ash Bardwaj. I am a travel journalist and a filmmaker. And today I have the great pleasure of interviewing my friend and colleague, a guy I've worked with quite a few times, Leveson Wood. Now, Leveson is known as a travel writer and a filmmaker. He's presented quite a few hit series now. The first one, of course, is Walking the Nile. He's been to the Himalayas. Uh, most recently, he circumnavigated the Arabian Peninsula. And as well as that, he has written nine books, or the ninth is coming out shortly. But the most recent one, and the one that we're going to be talking about today, is Encounters, which is all about Lev's photography. Because Lev, as well as being a writer, a filmmaker, and a presenter, is a very successful, published, and has had exhibitions as a professional photographer. So today we're going to be talking about Lev's photography through the book. So Lev, welcome. It's absolutely lovely to see you. Thank you, Ash. No, it's always a pleasure. And um, yeah, thank you to um, to everyone on the team for, for asking me back. And uh, of course, it's a bit different this year being virtual, but I um, hope, uh, hope you uh, enjoy the chat and um, look forward to telling you a bit about my photography. Well, for me, Ash, photography had always just been a bit of a hobby, really, um, until I left the army. Um, it was It was something I sort of played around with, obviously, I traveled a lot, but I hadn't taken it seriously. And in fact, it was something that uh, until I was sort of leaving the army, I almost um, avoided. I kind of had the mindset that to fully immerse yourself in a journey, you had to be in the moment and not and not too focused on documenting it. But of course, when I took up documentary making full time, um, I felt like it's something I should probably get the hang of and and learn my craft. So, um, yeah, back about 10 years ago, I, I bought my first proper camera and um, I set about sort of teaching myself. I never had any formal lessons um, or anything like that. I, I just started reading lots of photography magazines, actually. And bit by bit, I built up a portfolio of work. I set up a website and did everything from doing, you know, taking uh, friends' wedding photos, taking photos of people's babies and dogs and families, and slowly but surely, um, you, you know, taught myself the the art of photography. And um, it wasn't too long before I entered a few local competitions at home and um, won a couple of small prizes. And it was off the back of that, really, that I was then able to sell photos to magazines, newspapers. And um, uh, and then guidebooks, really. The travel photography um, began because I was organizing expeditions and going away as a guide. Um, I, I use that as an opportunity to get um, to get lots of photos and then sell them to, you know, Lonely Planet or whoever else it might be. So, um, yeah, that that was that was really where it all began. The very humble beginnings. Um, but it was something that I felt would complement my work as a as a writer and a filmmaker. Um, I remember back in uh, back in 2010 uh, when I bought my first camera. I thought the place that I can go and um, go and learn the best would be uh, a country that's very colourful and very close to my own heart. I actually I went to Mexico, having spent probably it was about three thousand pounds, which is all my money to my name. Um, on a nice camera, went to Mexico, and then literally on, I think, day three of the trip, um, it got stolen. I, it got nicked when I was traveling between two cities on one of those long-distance buses, and I fell asleep, woke up, camera, everything gone, um, and it wasn't insured. So that was that was a real disaster as far as my photography career uh, was going. But um, it was because of that um, I was introduced to a local Mexican photographer called Alberto. And he was a professional studio photographer. Um, but he said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed that you've had your equipment stolen in Mexico. So, look, I'm going to lend you a camera and I'm going to teach you basic photography. So it was actually really, um, really good to, to have that opportunity to learn under somebody who had been practicing and studying for a long time. And it was that 
little moment of serendipity that uh, enabled me to um, to actually practice my skills and uh, so and turn what could have been a, a big disaster into uh, an opportunity. Uh, Alberto and I have stayed very good friends ever since, and in fact, my new book um, Encounters is is dedicated to him for uh, for teaching me those basic skills. It slowly transformed from being just a hobby into something that I really enjoyed and i enjoyed learning about the the craft itself i enjoyed learning a bit about the technical side um so i just carried my camera everywhere that i went um and uh, you know because i was traveling to really interesting places um actually it wasn't that difficult to come away with some quite unique and interesting shots um i wasn't really doing much with them in those days um i was lucky if i could you know get get them published but usually it was for uh you know pennies if not usually for free um but it, I, you know like anything if you stick at it you suddenly collect a, a portfolio and sooner or later you can then start being taken seriously and um you can monetize it and that's what i did very slowly but it was really when i went away on walking the nile um that it came in really, really useful because I was desperate to, to document this journey in a way that would be appropriate to a, an expedition of that scale. And so I thought it'd be a shame not to have a good camera. So I did. I invested in a, in a really good camera. I went away and um, came back with something ridiculous, like 10,000 images. Um, so, you know, I slowly but surely built up this massive bank of images and and they of course appeared in my early books walking the nile walking the himalayas and um yeah and and, and it was great because i i developed my style it's kind of I, I i take to use the word but it's kind of like a bit of a blend a fusion between reportage photography and street photography but of course there's plenty of portraits and landscapes in there as well so it's a real blend what i'm trying to do with my images is capture a, a moment in time capture the people and the essence of the journey um often in some of the most remote uh, places on the planet and your your new book encounters uh i've been looking through it and it's beautiful it's, it's been wonderful having known you and your stories over the last few years seeing some of the pictures come up even from some of the locations that i joined you in every now and again but even for places where i was what's wonderful about seeing your photography in this book is i have seen those places and those stories in in new ways that you've you've told a story in a different way from how you've told it in the book from how it was told in the films. How long has this book been in the making? You talked about leaving the army in 2010. Um, I've seen some pictures in here going all the way back to a trip to Siberia in 2012. So it's certainly been in here, been going for quite a while. So how long has it been in the making and why did you choose the title Encounters to, uh, to title this book? Well, this really is a, a collection of images dating back over the last 10 years, you know, ever since I left the army and started with some of those um, early expeditions um, to Siberia, to Afghanistan, to Madagascar. Um, it spans that whole time. So this isn't just a, you know, I'm not just regurgitating images from my televised expeditions like Walking the Nile, although there are a few images from there. What I've tried to do is demonstrate uh, a collection of images from all around the world um, with my encounters with different people and communities um, dating back the last decade. So for me, it's been a great opportunity to go back through lots of old hard disks and old laptops. I mean, I, I counted something like 50,000 images that I had to go through, which I then had to shortlist down to about 5,000 images and then shortlist even more to the, the end product in this book, which is um, I think about 200 images. And, and that was a really tough process because you can imagine the, the amount of images that are quite similar, but maybe they tell a slightly different story. So it was a lot of work um, going back many, many years. And, uh, it, but it was a real sense of relief and a joy when it finally was published um, last year because um, to have a book like that, a, a, pro, a really smart coffee table book, I feel very proud of that because it's it's so different to my other work. 
Um, and and it's a real, it's, for me, it's a real treasure because I can open that sometimes if I'm feeling a bit down and it just brings back so many memories, um, so much nostalgia. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's a real gift, actually. And um, and uh, it's, it's it certainly kept me in pr Christmas presents for all my family and friends. <laughs> And I certainly, I certainly think for people that have followed your career for quite some time, seeing you from those early television programs on Walking the Nile, um, there'll be lots in here that they wouldn't have known about uh, and lots in here that shows the much broader remit of the work that you're interested in. Um, I've just caught an image from your trip to South Sudan in 2012. Uh, when you went and found this enormous digger out in the middle of the desert. So there's a whole host of additional stories, but of course there's writing in here as well. And you have a quite a lengthy introduction explaining photography and why you find it such an important craft, uh, why it brings you a different type of joy to the writing and the filmmaking. But you've also broken the book up into four different chapters, and we're going to go through them uh, by, and we're going to go through them by looking at an image from each of those chapters. And um, the first one is this fantastic image that we have from your first expedition, Walking the Nile. It's the Mandari cattle camp in South Sudan. So, can you tell me a little bit about that and about the chapter that it's in and why you have chosen to arrange the photos in this way? Well, that was one of the biggest challenges with this book was trying to decide how to curate the images. What are the themes and how I'm going to lay them out alongside each other? I didn't want to do um, just a simple chronology, um, nor did I want to do it as a geographical spread. I wanted to try and break it down into the themes that I have encountered the most throughout my travels. And I chose the word encounters for the title of the book because for me, that's what my journeys have been all about. It's been a, a string of amazing encounters with people, with communities, with ideas and concepts, religions, um, philosophies on life. And so what this book does, I think, hopefully, is tell the stories of the people that I meet or have met along the way. And so when I tried to break it down, I thought, what are the what are the, the main takeaways what are the main themes that i have encountered and uh the four themes that i've chosen for the book have been frontiers for the first one uh conflict um heritage and community and the first image that you you know we've got there this mandari cattle camp um really represents for me the idea of frontiers because when i go to remote areas some of these are in the borderlands of countries. Some of these are in remote areas geographically or isolated because of their um, political situation. Frontier can mean lots of different things. But with this image in particular, South Sudan, it was um, at the time the world's newest country, um, just coming out of the back end of a civil war that had been raging for decades. Um, geographically, it's very isolated. It's um, it's a very, very rural and sparsely populated part of Africa that sits on the frontier between the Islamic North and the Christian and animist South. Uh, physically, it's a, it's, a, it's a frontier land as well. To the north, you've got the Sahara Desert, and to the south, you've got the start of sub-Saharan Africa. So it really is a frontier, ta frontier country. And when you go there, um, I mean, I've been to South Sudan five or six times and it, it genuinely feels a bit like the Wild West. It's quite a lawless region. Everyone's carrying weapons um, and it's 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 deeply impoverished. It's a real tragedy in many ways. Um, but also there are these little glimmers of hope. And, and this image is one of them. The Mundari are one of the main tribes in South Sudan. Um, and whilst the main two tribes, the Dinka and the Nua, have been fighting for each other for, for quite some time, the Mundari, um, as, a, as, a, as a sort of race of um, cattle herders, uh, generally very peaceful, have been stuck in the middle of this conflict that's been raging for so long. And what they tend to do to avoid the conflict is take their cows, which are 
ultimately their main source of wealth and income. And they go and hide in the vast swamp areas, the wetlands of the Sud Swamp. And you find these floating islands of papyrus and on them are these amazing communities. And, and we went to visit um, the Mundari on one of these islands as part of my Walking the Nile um, expedition. And I stayed with them for a few days and it was a real privilege and an honor to be amongst this, this community whose culture has endured for so long. And it's a very rudimentary culture in many ways. Um, there's nothing by means of uh, technology or anything really to suggest that you know they were in the 21st century. Um, they live off their cows, they fish. Um, I mean, it's, it was amazing to see how they live almost solely off, off the land. Um, and it was remarkable to go and spend time with them. I and mean, their stoicism was, was incredible. I remember meeting one guy who was explaining that they can't swim in the river or get um, or, or, or sort of go for ba ba baths in the river because of the danger of crocodiles. So what they do to wash and how they brush their teeth is they basically use the back end of a cow. So you see these people um, having a having a shower from behind a cow and brushing their teeth using cow pee, which is a bizarre thing to think about. But I, it was a it was a sense of wonder, really, um, to to be amongst uh, people who live in such a different way to my own. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to use this image really to represent what a frontier can mean, even even in the modern world where we think we've kind of seen and done everything. Actually, there are still communities out there that live very different lives. And of course, it was quite a seminal moment in the series of your. Uh, walking the Nile trip, that episode, seeing you there. I remember you wrestling with this absolute giant of a man who'd grown up on a diet of milk, but was nearly seven feet tall, I believe. And you spending that time with those guys there, it was a, a wonderful example of how, even as you say, in places that have a very different type of society, apparently from the outside to what we think of, no technology uh, to, to, to speak of, living on a floating island, but you're still able to create this bond with them. And the image itself is really quite remarkable. I'm you know, looking at it now in front of me in the book, and uh, it looks such a cliche, but it looks like a Renaissance painting because of this light coming out of the sky and illuminating in silhouette the people and the smoke and dust coming up from the cattle camp. So would you like to talk a little about the the light and the, and the photograph itself, as well as the experience that you've had there? Because it's so easy to just think, we've all got iPhones, we can just snap a photograph. When we go somewhere interesting, we presume that it's good. But I remember the attention you were putting to your photography when we were walking, uh, for the elements I was with you on walking the Nile, the time, the effort, the way you were thinking about composition, the way you were speaking to me about it. And years later on Walking the Americas, Alberto saying to me, he's got a very good eye. He's got a better eye than me. He notices these things. He spots them and he really gets it. I remember Alberto, your mentor, telling me that. So do you just want to talk a little bit about the light in this photo, the Mandari Cattle Camp one? Well, like I say, I spent three days with the Mandari on this island and... It was hard not to get a good photo, I have to say, because of the way people were dressed, because of the almost biblical aspect of the landscape. And uh, the, like you say, the smoke rising from these dung fires and the fact that everyone's basically naked and carrying spears. And it, it was it was a real joy to go and just snap away. And, and the people there loved being photographed. You know, people were queuing up to be photographed and that always helps. But. And I've got lots of portraits from this place and I've got lots of images of, of action of people having the, the, the cow showers and, and milking the cows and, and things like that. But this image in particular, I remember because South Sudan, it rains a lot. You know, it's a very green country. I mean, this was the, the sort of dry season. But when when the light just shone through those clouds breaking through, it, it was almost heavenly and I knew I had to get an image that captured the scale so I remember just taking a, a step back I sort of 
ran away from this this encampment and just took it on um uh you know on, on a wide angle and just tried to capture the whole spirit of this place and like you say it's the silhouettes of people standing in the smoke you can't identify anyone's faces or features it it, it just take, gives it a very um almost surreal aspect and like you say it, it does feel a little bit like a, like a painting and i think this has been one of my most popular images that people want to buy because it you know whilst it is specific to south sudan it's something that i don't know you look at it and you could be almost anywhere you could be in a story or a fairy tale and, and that's what i love about this picture yeah i think you've really um summarized it really neatly at the end there why it appeals to so many people visually it sort of resonates with something this desire for mythology and this desire for fantasy that uh, we all have. It really is a beautiful photo. Uh, but it couldn't be in greater contrast to the next photo we're going to talk about, which is one of the photos from the conflict section. I guess people tend to think of frontiers and conflict as things that go together. But it would be great to hear you talk a bit about the, the notion of conflict. But this specific photo is very different. It's a photograph that you took in Homs in Syria during your circumnavigation of the Arabian Peninsula for um, the series Arabia. And this was at a time when Syria, ah, you tell the story of it, Lev, you tell us the story of why this photograph matters so much, why it's so different. And it's of a man walking down the street, a street that appears to be empty of people other than him, uh, of shattered buildings of, detritus and dust all over the place and a bicycle with a few belongings in the back of it can you tell us a bit about it so i went to syria um as part of my arabia journey back in 2018 and i went to the city of homs and now i'd been to syria before the civil war back in 2010 when it was very peaceful and I traveled through Homs and Aleppo and Damascus then. And it, it stood out in my mind as one of the, my favorite places of all time. The, the people, the landscape, the sense of history. Um, I've always had a real affinity to, to Arabia, to the Middle East. So to go back, uh, you know, in, in the middle of this civil war and see the destruction was truly heartbreaking and particularly in Homs I mean I, I've been to Mosul and I've been to other de destroyed cities but Homs was on another level I mean the the destruction it looked like an atomic bomb had just been dropped on this city everything for as far as the eye could see completely destroyed um, and walking through these streets where there was just I suppose the remnants of people's lives everywhere just you know dolls and toys and school books it really brings it home that this is not some movie set it's where people used to live and it was really uh, heartbreaking to see but again I was trying to find out is there any hope left and I encountered I bumped into this man this old man he was pushing his little bicycle along and he parked it up and he started like clambering over the rubble and I, I took that that shot as he was walking away from me. But I, I got chatting to him and, and he actually explained what he was doing. And he was the first person to return to that segment of the city in Homs um, just a few weeks after it had been reclaimed by government troops from ISIS. And he told me his story about how so many members of his family had been killed um, or who'd fled the country. A number, his own children had fled to go and live in refugee camps or try to get to Europe, but he'd stayed. Um, he was determined to rebuild his home. And he, like I say, he was the first person to try and do that. And, and so I followed him. He invited me to come and see his little flat, his one bedroom um, apartment in, in the city, which was basically just a, a pile of rubble. And I said, you can't live here. And he said, I will, I will come back. And we, you know, there was no running water. There's nothing, nothing at all. But he was determined that that one day he'd be able to to live in his home he wasn't giving up and i think that spirit of resilience and stoicism really is representative of of people um in that country who've gone through so much and i saw it time and again in in uh, in damascus which is a beautiful city um it was very bizarre because the central part of damascus had thankfully avoided much of the conflict 
and so people were living normal lives there but coffee shops and restaurants were open so you could, it was strange because you could be sitting there having a cup of coffee or indeed a glass of wine you know it's weird because in damascus there's nightclubs and bars and yet just three miles away in some of the suburbs you could hear the mortars landing and bombs going off so a very surreal experience but i remember walking around the citadel and the shopping area and, and a lot of the old tourist shops were open which i was quite shocked by because i didn't see any tourists and i went and got chatting to uh, an old carpet seller and i said i was just you know chit chatting away and asked him if he'd sold many carpets and he laughed at me and said no of course i've not sold a single carpet in seven years which begs the question, of course, why is the shops open? Why do they bother? And he looked at me as if I was asking a ridiculous question. He said, well, of course we keep the shops open because the tourists will come back. He said, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not even for another five years, but one day they will come back and we must be open. And I think that that, that sense of positivity and optimism against all odds is what has kept people going. So I was really taken aback by that and that was very moving. So this image... I, for me, is very powerful because it represents hope um, amid such devastation. And, and conflict is something that I've encountered in most of my journeys, all of my journeys, in fact, going across the front lines, but nowhere more so than in the Middle East and on my Arabia journey. So there's a lot of images from the Middle East in this book, um, but not, not not just there. You know, the conflict, I've, I've tried to, to show the sense of humanity, not just the negativity, uh, but also... A sense of optimism and 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 the human stories because that for me is the most important and the most interesting it's not just showing bombed out buildings it's about telling the stories of the people that have had to live through this and survive and ultimately try and thrive um in a way that it very hard for us in the west who've not lived through that to understand i think again skill the photographic skill that you use in order to tell the story through the picture you have these leading lines of the pavement of the buildings with the man walking down the street in the center and the bicycle in the foreground uh, on a it looks like a wide lens if you've used to take this picture and again it's that case of having that background of skill that you've built up over the years that you've developed over time that means that when the moment arrives you don't have to think about that it just all happens it allows you to tell the story and and tell it in that deeper way and looking through the conflict chapter, as you mentioned, you've talked about lots of different things in there. One, one set of photographs I just briefly like to mention in this chapter are the photographs from, um, from, from poaching. So you've got some photographs, I think they're from Uganda, the ones of the elephant tusks. I know uh, you've got uh, some from Virunga uh, and also some from Botswana. And your previous book, of course, were, was uh, Walking with Giants. Uh, sorry, The Last Giants and the series Walking the Giants. And conservation and protection of biodiversity has always been a big part of your work. And I think you've done a really good job of highlighting how it actually drives conflict. So it's great to see it in this conflict chapter. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, or could you just tell me a little bit about how you have chosen to put that in here and how that's affected your work yeah so conflict of course can come in many forms and this chapter covers conflicts ranging from the ganglands of central and south america to the war zones of uh, the middle east but also some of the more forgotten wars like nagorno karabakh in um on the fringes of europe um or or indeed you know some of the armed struggles that are going on um across asia but but this one in particular in um in in central and, and and east africa um the war against poaching the war to save the, the the wildlife is is something that you wouldn't necessarily um think about as, as a conflict zone but it, it is for the rangers who are doing this job day in day out and i've seen it myself like you say in in the congo um and in botswana where you have these 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 people who are often civilians they're not necessarily military trained they, they're given a uniform given a weapon and then told to go and protect the elephants um, often against very determined hardened criminals armed with high-tech weapons and a lot of money who are going in there to to kill 
wildlife and and they these are you know these are warriors they they have to they have to fight and there's often pretty big battles going on and, and i've spent a bit of time with these rangers um on patrol um collecting snares collecting traps and uh and it's it's a, it's a real fight and, and and so i wanted to include this in in the conflict chapter to demonstrate that this asymmetric warfare is going on and uh, and it's something that we can't ignore and i think it's a very important story to tell another thing you do cover quite movingly in this chapter is the legacy of war and the photographs that really stand out to me in that are the ones of the democratic republic of congo when you went out with unicef yeah i mean the i i was very fortunate to go out to drc in october 2019 with unicef for who i um I'm a, a sort of a supporter um, and, and they invited me to go and see the work that they're doing to rehabilitate former child soldiers. And some of these kids and they are kids are, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old who have been forced into this conflict, often by being kidnapped and forced to fight um, often against their own families. Very, very tragic stories. Um, but the great work being done by UNICEF and other charities is to to try and support them to uh, reintegrate into society and, and 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 that's what i wanted to show with these images is how that is being done and show that the face of war isn't always a grizzled veteran you know often it's it's by some of the most vulnerable people in society and and that legacy of war and that tragedy is something that i want to show uh shine a light on that it's not as simple or or, or as black and white as we often think of course because they were children you couldn't show their faces so you've used different ways to tell the story of how they that stories that affected that individual not just all of them being in silhouette but it's really quite moving it's not worth me talking through the images themselves but it, it's it's a part of the book that really i found very powerful and the next chapter that we're going to come on to is heritage and the photograph that you've used that we're going to talk about today is this beautiful silhouette from the Dofar Ridge in Oman, where I was actually with you again during your circumnavigation of Arabia. And it's a Jibali camel herder with his camel. Tell us a bit about this picture, Lynn. I love this image because for me, that, that trek over the Dofar Ridge um, in Oman was just one of the most spectacular walks i've ever done and um you know it, you, you were there ash it was it was just beautiful wasn't it i mean going through these ancient um forests of frankincense and and climbing up these caves and i mean it's it's like the grand canyon when you're sort of climbing up there it's, it's absolutely remarkable um for me it was a very special part of that journey it was a side of arabia that i i just wasn't prepared for it it just blew me away visually and to be in the company of these Jabali people, these uh, mountain men, very hardened, grisly men who had, had spent their lives growing up in caves um, with their camels. And the, the camels there were amazing. You know, they, they weren't normal desert camels that sort of plod along. These camels were really hardcore cliff, cliff climbers. And, and, and it was this guy in, in the image, he was the sort of one of the lead guides. He was only a young man, but um, you can see the silhouette there. And in, in his hand is a sword. This guy carried a broadsword with him. Um, and it, it, the, the image, it looks almost sort of medieval, doesn't it? And it's um, it sort of conjures up these thousand and one nights. It's quite a romantic image of, of Arabia. But the story behind the, the sword is, is somewhat grisly. He carries it because if a camel slips and breaks its neck, he has to kill the camel with the sword um, by by basically slitting its throat so um i wanted to capture that raw rawness of the journey but in a really romantic romanticized and stylized image there so it, it, it's kind of a picture postcard image in some ways but the reality behind it was was uh was quite raw and authentic and uh and the view of the cliffs going back for as far as the eye can see um just conjures up so many um ideas of uh, of vastness and the scale of it was was just really beautiful it was uh, a truly amazing place to be and one of the great things that your work does not just 
uh, in the photography, but also the work that you do through your through your books and television, is to show that there are still places of wonder and cultural interest in the world. There's a lot of lazy commentary around about how through globalization the world is all the same, that there's no wonder, there's no adventure left to be had. But you're, you've shown that in a one of the more touristically developed nations of the Middle East, Oman, that there is still these amazing regions that you can go and visit and spend time with people and really encounter a very different heritage. Within other parts of this chapter, you've uh, visited Kenya and Japan. Again, places where the lazy cliche is that the heritage has been wiped out by globalization and development. But you show throughout this chapter that it's possible to find these things just by doing a bit of work and, importantly, engaging with people. Yeah, this chapter really is all about, for me, it's all about contrasts. And it's it's often showing the juxtaposition of old versus new. And in places like Japan, you know, some of my images there show, you know, these these amazing geisha ladies crossing a road um, with the, 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 the sort of neon lights of modern Japan or indeed in somewhere like Saudi Arabia where you see these warriors um, in, in traditional costume, but then he's in one hand, he's got a uh, his dagger and the other hand, he's got a, a mobile phone. And it's things like that, that it shows the heritage, but doesn't sugarcoat it. What I want to do is, is demonstrate how often culture and legacy can thrive even within the, the, the sort of new modernity that we live in. And, and that's what this chapter is about. It's about showing how showing change it's showing how sometimes cultures will change but parts of it will and parts of it won't and uh hopefully in doing so it can it can regenerate that spark of wanderlust within us all and, and show that there's still plenty of interesting things out there to discover uh, it's a really good chapter to demonstrate the different types of photography you do i mean you, you spoke earlier about your style and reportage obviously in this chapter and again in the chapter about to come to you, you've asked people to stand for a photograph, but you're not someone that's producing photo shoots. You know, he talks about these juxtapositions that you see in Japan, that you see in Saudi Arabia, and they you spot something happening and you, you grab the photograph rather than overly producing the image. And some of them are of people and some of them are of landscapes and people in landscapes. But I think that ability to just seize the moment and document it well is something you you do very well and a great example of that is the final photograph we're going to talk about which is this absolutely striking um young lady striking girl um eloisa in brazil who has the most remarkable eyes and is in it what appears to be a traditional outfit can you tell us a bit more about it so eloisa not eloisa eloisa so the final chapter, community, the idea was to show how regardless of which part of the world you're from or which culture or which um, religion or anything like that, that, that people are people. And that sense of community is central to what unites us and, and to showcase that there are far more things that do unite us than divide us. And I think that's a particularly important message in today's polarized world. And this image uh, of Eloisa, she was um, a young girl from the Desana tribe in Brazil, right in the heart of the Amazon, um, not far away from the, the city of Manaus, which is sort of a, quite a big industrial city um, on the river, on, on the Amazon River itself. But you don't have to go far to meet the, the indigenous communities. So a couple of hours upstream, there was a, you know, what you'd expect, a sort of typical thatched hut um community um and and the people there you know sometimes would wear traditional costumes sometimes um they wouldn't you know and and, and just depended and and I, I didn't want to shy away from that i didn't want to sort of um again sugarcoat coat this idea that you don't have to go far before you see people dressed in feathers and things because a lot of the time they will only put the feathers on if a tourist comes and i i talk about that in in the book actually but they will wear them 
um, for certain religious ceremonies and, and so on. But what for me was more important wasn't wasn't the outfit or the or the, or the clothing that, that this girl was wearing. It's what she represented, because whilst she was of a an indigenous community, as you can see by her her eyes, very striking eyes. She's got quite a European face. When I asked the um, her mother if I could take this young girl's photograph, she was saying, "Of course, she's the most beautiful girl in the village. Why wouldn't you take her photograph?" And um, I, I asked, I said, "Is you know, what's the sort of heritage?" And she said, "Well, you know, the the white man came here some time ago and, and left his left his genes behind." So. There is Brazil's a good example of of a real fusion of different cultures. It's 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 a real melting pot of um, of different ethnicities, and um, I, it, it was amazing because you don't really see. Well, certainly I didn't when I was there. You don't really encounter racism because it, you you see people of every um, every ethnicity, every race, um, and there's no real barriers to that. You'll you'll see couples of of all different um, backgrounds together. And it, it's a really heartwarming thing to see, actually. And, and and even in the in the indigenous communities, they, it was something that they were very proud of. She said, yeah, she's a she's a blend. And what she represented, this young girl, Eloisa, was was that sense of unified humanity and um, and uh, and the fact we're all we're all human beings. And that's what I wanted to show. Can you talk a bit about some of the other photographs that you've got in this? There's a, a great one of a baby being weighed in. Is it Botswana? It's, uh, um, I'm just trying to find out. Uh, no, D DRC again on that same trip from uh, UNICEF. And uh, a couple of fishermen on Lake Choga. So you've got quite a lot of different photographs that you use to talk about community in this. So you've talked a bit about sort of the wider human community that's all being part of the human human race. But you've also shown some more specific things from different communities of things that are just people going around their normal business. And that's it. You know, most of the time I'm not seeking anything other than the, the norm, really. I'm trying to show normal life in cultures that are different to our own and um, and how people do things similarly and how people do things differently. And and the one of the baby being weighed is it's it's these two um, sort of community nurses weighing a baby. Normally, you know, if you if you were to take a baby to be weighed in, in the West, I'm sure it would be um, it would be done uh, according to the highest health and safety standards here. They literally have one of those sort of. Um, one of those scales um, that you put up on a on a hook, and and they just like basically hook the baby on a tree to weigh to weigh the little baby, and um, it was done very lovingly and very gently. But gosh, I think there'd be a lot of mothers back home that would be tearing their hair out if they saw that. Um, but equally, you know, people fucking people people just going out shopping, people having an ice cream. It's it's kind of like normal life, but not as we know it. And it's great to see all these different photos alongside each other as the but progresses and seeing the dates in it reminds us again of just how long you've been doing this. So photography has always been this thing that's gone in your background and really it was what you set out to do as your career really before the writing came along and before the presenting came along. So it's ironic that it's taken so long for you to eventually have the photography book out. But I think it's a really good illustration of that, um, that aphorism, it takes 10 years to become an overnight success of so all the work that you put in, in order to get up to this point. I remember before you set out on Walking the Nile, when you decided to invest the last bit of your savings, because almost all of the money had gone, well, all of the money got into funding the trip and getting yourself out there in the first place. And then the last bit you had, which you'd put aside quite some time before, really saved up for, was to get a really good camera. And... I think there's certainly something to be said of that commitment of this is what I'm going to do. And in order to prove to myself and make sure I really take it serious, I'm going to get this camera. And <laughs> you only took one bit with you, didn't you? So it was funny because I, I remember when I when I first left the army and I was like going camera shopping. I was in New York and I went into this this camera shop and saw the most beautiful camera I'd ever seen, a Leica camera an old M series one. And it, it looks just like a really sturdy old fashioned film camera, but this was the first iteration of the digital ones. 
and I wanted it, but then I saw the price tag. It was, a, I won't say how much it cost, so I couldn't afford it. So I got a, a much cheaper one. And that's what I practiced on. And then, like I said before, it got stolen in Mexico. So before the Nile, I remember thinking, you know what? I'm going to go and ask Leica if they will sponsor my trip or at least give me a free camera. So I walked in and, and introduced myself and they and they basically told me to uh, <laughs> disappear. Not a chance. So I said, fine, I'm just going to basically, like you say, commit to this. I went and bought myself a Leica camera using every every penny of my overdraft. And off I went to walk the Nile, took lots of photographs, came back. And then when it went on television, of course, Leica got back in touch and said, OK, you've, you've, proved, you've proved to us your, your commitment. Now we'll sponsor you. So I've been a very proud Leica ambassador ever since for the last seven years now. And I'm very, very lucky to be able to um, road test their equipment. And I've, I've taken Leica cameras with me on all my expeditions um, since then. And I've, prob I've probably broken quite a few in the process. <laughs> so I wonder if they're regretting that decision. But um, but yeah, no, it's it, it's great. You know, uh, now to, to finally, after all these years, not not shy away from the term professional photographer, because there, there's often a bit of... Um, there's often a bit of sort of uh, fear about, oh, I'm a professional photographer. I need to know everything about photography. But, but actually now, when when I when I sort of see the work, actually, it's like I say, this is ten years' work. It's a long, it's a long time to be doing something. But um, I'd like to think now whether or not I'm uh, technically any good is 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 by the by. It's I, I'm very happy with with the work that I've produced, and I just hope that other people will find some enjoyment from it. Yeah, I've always found it very inspiring as something to take into other fields as well. You're not someone who is a Photoshop fanatic. I think you use Lightroom as the only thing you ever use for doing a bit of adjusting on your photos. You're not someone that spends hours and hours doing that digital post-production. For you, it's very much about the story you're finding within it and getting the right photo in the first place rather than trying to mess around with it afterwards. You're also not a kit monkey. You're not obsessed with knowing all of the details of the way the, the lens was ground or, or anything like that. You focused on getting the skill right and doing lots of practice. And I think that's really quite inspirational for anybody who's trying to get into anything because there's so much when you're trying to start a new skill um, or develop a, a skill or an interest to spend the money, to do all the courses. And you've shown that all you need to do is have enough kit to, to practice and enough kit to develop that school, an interest and a passion, and then just go out and do lots of it. And uh, maybe 10 or 11 years down the line, other people will also be having a professional photography book. But for those people that um, are budding photographers, whether those are people who are at the start of their career to become a professional or just someone who's interested in doing it on holiday or to support other parts of their work that they're already up to, what would you say are the, I don't know, the simple philosophies that you've learned about travel or the tips that you would have for any budding photographer? I think you summed it up very nicely there. For me, it's not about the kit or the equipment or which lens you shot it on. To be honest, that doesn't really interest me as much as the end product about getting a really powerful, striking image that tells a story. And and that's what my images hopefully do. It's they're not just pretty pictures about landscapes. They are the subject matter is is telling somebody's story in their own environment. And, and and often it's the journey to get there because an image isn't just a you know that digital file. It's it's the months of preparation and planning and cost that goes into the journey to get to a specific place. So um, it's all well and good being a good technical photographer, but you've got to get, you've got to be put yourself in the right place at the right time to get those good images. So for me, it's far more about being a good traveler first and foremost, because, you know, it's honing the communication skills and the um, the sort of diplomacy skills to enable me to to convince somebody to let me take their picture in the first place. And then that's far more important than which lens you shot it on. <laughs> and we touched on earlier about those photographs I've seen from your early days around London. Do you still spend time now going around the UK? Obviously, we've had a, a year where travel has been limited. Are you still taking photographs around 
London? Are you still keeping your eye in doing those sorts of things? Yeah, I take my camera wherever I can. Um, you know, I, I love just taking photos for the sake of it. You know, even if it doesn't have a specific uh, publication in mind, I will. I love taking photos of, of the UK or anywhere else. So um, you've got to keep the joy. And, and it's, it's one thing being sent on assignment or, you know, going away to see it as a job. But I just like the process of, of creativity and, and actually creating something that is beautiful and interesting. And, and for me, um, it, it's not always about, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the it's not about just having a, a book or anything like that. It's about um, it's sometimes just for me. And some of these images will never see the light of day. But I quite like that. And now that you are allowed to call yourself a professional photographer, what are the things that that has opened up to you that maybe you weren't doing before? You talked about the UNICEF project. Are there any other projects that you've done as a photographer and not just as part of your work as a explorer and travel writer and filmmaker? Yeah, I mean, the, the photography has opened up a number of things. I mean, I, I will often just go out and do a lot of photography for, like you say, charities. I mean, I, I really love um working with charities like unicef where i get to go and uh hopefully do something good with my photography i've done a lot with conservation charities across africa um i work with the tusk trust and i've gone out to photograph some of their projects everything from elephants in in botswana and kenya to gorillas in uganda um and then i've done bits with with the military as well and, and i've been fortunate enough to to go out and and photograph um you know the troops in in croatia or japan and different places so it's been a really diverse um photography career over the last 10 years hopefully it won't take me another 10 years to build up enough photographs to 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 publish another book but um like i say for me First and foremost, it's been a real joy. It's it's been been a hobby that I've never lost the love for, um, probably because it's it's not something I've done as my first and foremost job, really. And and by having it as my sort of second or third uh, project, it's it's been something that I've I've really really enjoyed um, just for fun. Well, until we have another ten years of photographs to turn into a second book, I. I think this is a wonderful uh, document and a wonderful record of your journey so far and your photography so far. So Encounters is out now. Of course, the best place to get it is Stanford's, the home of travel writing and the home of travel books. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Lev, about the journey you've been on. I knew some of these stories and I knew elements of how you got through to where you are now in your photography, but it's been great for you to talk about it so honestly and openly and share some stories we've never seen before and it's been such a pleasure for me as a as a friend of yours to read this book and see and learn so much more about these trips and see these stories in an entirely different way so encounters is out now and thanks so much for your time there thanks for talking to me today thank you ash it's been a real uh, a real privilege and and really good fun as ever thank you mate fantastic thank you lev and ash well now you too can read that book and learn about Lev's multiple ambitious challenges by picking up your copy of Encounters, A Photographic Journey at stanfords.co.uk. Witness over a decade worth of images from war zones to some of the least accessible places on our planet. Our stores are a treasure trove, so it's no surprise stanfords.co.uk has Lev's seven other books too as well as being the quickest way to find our other 23 events that make up the Stanford's Travel Writers' Festival 2021.